Doug is here, that means we can get started. <coughs> Thanks everybody for coming. And it's just fair warning, I'm recording the lecture and I'm going to uh, post it on YouTube. So anything you say will be uh, part of the public domain. And um, today's lecture is going to be on bisphosphonates in the orthopedic surgeon. And I say orthopedic surgeon because I'm an orthopedic surgeon and everything is centered around my universe. Right, Doug? Yes, sir. Okay. So the essence of uh, bisphos the, the, the goal of bisphosphonates is to stop fractures. And that's kind of like its uh, reason to being as far as we're concerned as orthopedic surgeons. But there are other reasons to have it. And what's a bisphosphonate? There's a chemical structure. It's two phosphate groups, and it's very similar to pyrophosphate, which is the uh, chemical used uh, in ATP, or the Krebs cycle. Do you guys remember that from uh, biochemistry? Everybody says yes. Sure. Christina, Do Megan. Do I use it daily? I'm not huh? sure. Remember the Krebs cycle? I just wrote a prescription for that. Yeah. Really? You wrote a prescription <laughs> for the Krebs cycle? <laughs> we can you, those in the gym. Can you write it out for everybody? It's a little old lady. She needs some energy. So have yeah, some have some ATP. It's very important. Okay, and there's one more thing. Who gets fractures? Did you know about fracs, Doug? Yeah. You do? Yeah. I didn't know about it. It's the, it's the World Health Organization um, a, bill, a way to assess uh, fracture uh, uh, risk factors. So if you type in, if you go to Google and type frax, F-R-A-X, like fracture, uh, the World Health Organization will give you a fracture risk, risk assessment of how likely this person is to fracture. I think it's good for everybody. So if someone says, am I at risk? You can just go to the website and just type in their date. You can just probably do this. Anybody can do this. D date of birth. Um, let's see. Previous fracture. Fractured hip, parent had a fractured hip. Smoker. Glucocorticoids. Rheumatoid arthritis. Secondary osteoporosis. Alcohol. Three units a day. And then the femoral neck bone, men bone mineral density. So you'd have to get that too from a uh, DEXA scan. So I found this is very interesting. So... How does a, I won't go into this in great detail, but basically osteoporosis has to do with calcium. You eat the calcium through your uh, gut, and then it gets absorbed. And then the parathyroid hormones regulate the level of calcium, and it goes into your bones. And vitamin D uh, helps with the absorption process from the gut uh, into the uh, cells. So it's very um, basic. When you get a DEXA scan, I'll show you a DEXA scan, they usually give you a number of standard deviations. And if you're greater than 2.5 standard deviations, that's by definition, and definitions are a human invention. You have osteoporosis versus osteopenia. So when do you lose bone mass? Your bone mass gets, keeps getting stronger up to the age of um, 25 to 30. So when you're like Nate's age, you're at your max, like Nate's at his max right now. And then uh, after about 10, 20 years, you start looking like Doug. And then uh, every year you get a little bit, um, <laughs> I'm just kidding, Doug, I'm just bothering you. Every year you get a little bit weaker. So I'm 20 years from my bone density max. So you get this, uh, you get this scan when you send somebody for a DEXA scan, and it shows you where you are for your age-matched uh, people. So that's like people like you, that gives you a Z score, and it also gives you a T score, which is uh, the T score is your standard deviation from people at your max uh, bone health, and the T score is what you use clinically, not your Z score. So if you're 95 years old and you're average for a 95-year-old woman, most 95-year-old women are osteoporotic, so it doesn't really help you. So the people don't usually use that in studies and in treatments. It's the T score, which is your max health. And if you're 2.5 standard deviations, that's enough to start treatments, chemical treatments. And um, just, one, just one more thing is um, everybody, every, everybody should be on, uh, that we see for fractures or bone health, should be on calcium and vitamin D. So um, does anybody have a rule of thumb of how much you should use or take? Just from my reading, it's about a, a gram and a half of calcium. And vitamin D is somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 units. 
So everybody should be on calcium and vitamin D pretty much as they get older, 50, 60. So actually all women, I think, all women should be on calcium and vitamin D. And then if, um, so that's just... Maintenance is 1,000 milligrams for women. <clears throat> Postmenopausal is 1,500. I mean, nursing woman is 2,000 grams a day. Nursing is 2,000, okay. Yeah, and when you're nursing, you're supposed to pump it up to 2,000. And then vitamin D is like 1,000 a week, I believe, is the recommendation. Okay, I'm not sure about that, but uh, some, it's, that's about right. So this, this basic lecture is about bisphosphonates, and the, and the most common one used, and the only generic is Fosamax. And there's many bisphosphonates out in the, uh, in the market, but Fosamax um, is, was the first to market in 1995, and it went generic in 2008. And it's uh, alendronate. And there are many out there, Fosamax, Boniva, Actinel. The ones I use are Fosamax, Boniva, Actinel and Reclass, and Reclass is the injection type. Um, does anybody else use any other uh, bisphosphonates, Doug? Uh, use any other ones? There's a, um, there's a smurm that I use. Uh, the, um, smurm? Selective estrogen receptor blocker. Um, Are you serious? You use something, something different? Yeah. All right, and they all they all vary from the side chain, so they're very similar drugs, but they vary from the side chain slightly. And how do they work? Is they basically increase uh, the death of the osteoclast. So you two, you have two type of cells: the osteoclast, which is the one on the left there that eats bone away, and on the one on the right is the osteoblast that lays down bone. And you need both, basically, to have a normal bone. You need turnover. So bisphosphonates increase apoptosis of the osteoclast. In other words, apoptosis is cell death. So the bisphosphonates kill the osteoclasts. And therefore, those osteoclasts, since they're dead, they're not around to eat up the bone. And since, they're, and since they're, uh, you, don't, you don't have these things eating up your bone, your bone gets stronger. And the way that the bisphosphonates work is they get deposited inside of the bone. So they're, they're, they're inside of your trabeculi. So they last a long time. Evista. Oh, Evista, yeah, that's right. So you can see here in this uh, cartoon, you see those little, that little circle on the bottom, the bisphosphonate incorporated in hydroxyapatite. So the bisphosphonate goes into your bone and gets deposited there. And it's sitting around there, and it's, I guess it poisons the osteoclast, and it dies. So that's how the bisphosphonate works. And then bisphosphonates um, are cleared uh, by the kidneys. So if you're going to treat this uh, people, you have to make sure they have normal uh, kidney function, especially with uh, reclass, the injection uh, medications. So there are other indications other than osteoporosis. There's Paget's disease. There's bone metastases. If you have bone mets, uh, bone mets are treated with uh, bisphosphonates. Multiple myeloma, primary hyperparathyroidism, and of course, what we're going to talk about is osteoporosis. So this is this is what prompted me to to go over this. Is this I was on call two weeks ago, and um, it was a 56 year old woman who uh, tripped and fell from a standing position from a rug. So by definition, when you fall from a standing position, you're not supposed to break something. So by definition, if you fall from a standing position and you break something, uh, that's a fragility fracture. So obviously, you know, we can argue this, you know, forever, but by definition, that's a fragility fracture if you fall from a standing. So that's what she did. So Doug, would that make sense to you if someone fell from a standing position to have this injury? So what? So the other past medical history is um, she's on rheumatoid. She has rheumatoid arthritis. She's on steroids. She lives alone, divorced, and on that same side, <coughs> she had a total knee replacement five years ago. So uh, what are your thoughts now, Doug? You say, let's say you're the orthopedic surgeon on call. What do you do? I want to get an X-ray of her whole femur. Okay. To see what her knee looks like. Okay. 
So there's a front view. So just to, just for everybody, like how would you describe it? It's a uh, mid shaft or sub I think it's a mid shaft femur fracture. Okay, and it, it looks like it looks like it's right at the um, at the uh, isthmus, doesn't it, of the canal? It's like that's kind of where the canal gets tight, isn't it? Yeah. And just. Um, this is this is a little bit of a trick question. I'm, I'm trying to get you with something, but does the cortex look normal on the femur? Does like you know how the cortex no, hypertrophic. looks a little bit hypertrophic laterally, right? So, yeah. So let me show everybody. Ooh. Let me show what what it does. Is. See that right there? See how that's um, that's a little thick. So the, the outside the outside of the femur is thick there. It, sh it should be like a uniform thickness, pretty much. Does uh, anything you want to change with the side view, Doug? Add anything to you? Uh, not really. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm sorry I don't have the whole femur pre-op, but how would you how would you treat this um, case? 56 years old, femur fracture. She came in on a Sunday. She's MPO. Healthy, otherwise, other rooms are arthritis. And you know how you call the OR right away to put her on the schedule so you didn't get bumped by lap coley? Yeah. I called the OR. Bring her up. And they said, bring her up. Yeah. So what do you do? I scramble to make sure we have equipment. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So, so you got to get her on the schedule. And then the, then the radiologist says, I mean, the, the anesthesiologist says, we have time. So you're like, so I was lucky in that case. That's what they said. They said, you know, you want to do it? Do it now. I was like, all right. So I had to drop my kids off uh, at my parents' house, and I drove up. So what would you do with this fracture, uh, Doug? Uh, I would consider intramedullary fixation. Okay, so you'll intramedullary fix it, and um, you do a primary, uh, like a um, standard primary uh, femoral nail, or a, a secondary uh, nail, like a gamma nail, or a retrograde, like a, uh, would you do a retrograde, antegrade? Well, uh, um, I'd probably do an antegrade, I'm, I'm, you know, because she has a replacement on that side so might have trouble I probably can't get around it very easily so I do a, probably a standard IM male or a, uh, or Just a standard uh, uh, second generation hip screw okay and you put her on the fracture table I did. and what do you do for traction you just put it in a boot or you put boot. a pin okay. No, boot. Boot. okay so I did the same thing I put her on the fracture table put the boot on tracked her out and if you see this that looks um, that looks perfect right perfect reduction on the AP film and again, remember what Doug said? The um, look laterally uh, at the femur. See how it's really thick there? So that's the evidence that this was a stress fracture. So was this woman on uh, this phosphate? Yeah, she was on it for like 10 years. So the thing is, when you fix them, you have to take them off with this phosphate for about two months or so. Yeah, until the fracture is healed. Here's a side view. Are you happy with that? or? Yeah, so that, that's probably close enough. So here's the um, the nail. I just used the primary um, first generation nail, only because that's all we had in the uh, hospital, so I can do it right away. And um, is that a Synthes nail? That is that's a Synthes nail. Yeah, I, th I think so. And we have those in stock. That was the only one that was in the hospital. <laughs> I know it's always. I never know what they have. You know, so I know, and it always it changes, too. How fast can you get something? <laughs> it, it changes, too. So I had to call around a couple reps, and the one rep said, yeah, it's in the hospital right now. So, all right, let's use it. And then you can see the uh, laterally. Look at the look at the, how thick it is. So so that's like a stress. Um, it's a stress fracture. So tell everybody, Doug, like how, what is a stress fracture, and why does it look thick there, and so everybody knows. Well, it... Um Stress fracture is usually something on the uh, convex side of the bone. It usually occurs from the in, from a inability of the bone to heal or remodel properly. So the analogy is you have a paper clip and it bends a little bit and it bends a little bit and it bends a little bit. It's great, it's great, it's great, and then all of a sudden it's snapped. So um, there's a German word that describes these, an umbasal or fracture or something like that, but sometimes like in people with um, pagets or something, see they have like uh, lines on the outside of their femur where they've had sort of multiple stress fractures. Uh, and how does it happen? It's just a bone. It's a bone is very rigid there. It's a lever arm. And um, uh, the way bone remodels in time is that it becomes, uh, the diameter increases as the cortex decreases. So what you do is you bring the center of uh, uh, increase For the old radius. people, yeah, 
have for, as elderly people they get what we call stovepipe femur. So that's kind of a different process. But right. so old people they, they get they get their diameters get wider, and it's because uh, it's because well, they have less bone. They have less bone, so it's a it's a, a, a the strength of the bone comes from a cylinder. I don't know if you guys can understand this, but if uh, if you say uh, if you say can this piece of paper hold a ten pound weight, like can you hold up ten pound? The, you say impossible, right? But if you if you fold a piece of paper into a cylinder, it can. You can put a ten pound weight on this. That's the strongest form architecturally. So what what the body does is it makes the cylinder bigger, so that it's stronger. Does that make sense? So the so the outer part doesn't have to be as strong. So that's that's why the body has a naturally knows how to make things stronger. So naturally the cylinder is the biggest. So you reamed this? Yeah, I reamed it. Yeah, to get a big nail in so I can let her walk. It was a little bit tough, yeah. And the other, so what happens in bisphosphonates is the osteoclasts, um, the process is, is destroyed with the bisphosphonate, the stress fracture. So people develop stress fractures as a, after a long period of time because the normal remodeling process of the bone is damaged from bisphosphonates. So people present with these fractures, femur fractures, which is like a big deal. Here's a side view. And this just shows you um, how we do it. We put a, we put a, a, a wired past the fracture, which sometimes can be difficult. And you can see a side view, that's my locking screw, and you can see she has a total knee in. So it didn't make the surgery any more difficult, but uh, like Doug says, you can't go through the knee. But this case probably works better. And then the other thing is, uh, I call everything I do, I always call my brother, because we always share our stories. And he goes, oh, he goes, take an x-ray of the other side, just to see what that side looks like. And are you worried about this side, Doug, or no? Yeah, what is that? I don't, I don't know uh, what that is. I don't know what it, what it is either. But yeah, and then, and then this kind of looks thick, doesn't it? it? Yeah, I'm over reading it, but it looks like at the top of, uh, at the top of right here, is this something? I don't know. Now I'm you're wondering if it. she's going to break the other side. Yeah. But, um. To bring her back, you know, six yeah, weeks I, and her over yeah, and I told her, and she said her thigh hurt for months. The, fra the fractured side. She had a stress side, fracture. Yeah. And here's a, here she came back two weeks post-op, and you can see she's already uh, laying down callus um, from the fractures uh, side. And you can see the callus there 12, 12 days post-op. You can see how thick she is there from her stress fracture. So, so um, what, what is this process? People, uh, it seems counterintuitive, but people on bisphosphonate get these atypical, what they call atypical femur fractures, but they're very rare. So, they happen um, 272 and 14,000, uh, and it's, it's probably like one in a thousand or something. It's a very low number. And if you look at, if, you, if people have osteoporosis and they say, what's more common for me to get an osteoporosis fracture or these femur fractures? The, the answer is 40 to 1. So there's a 40 times chance that you'll get an osteoporosis fracture versus a 1 chance for these unusual fem femoral shaft fractures. So they're very rare. So it's definitely worth put, treating people with bisphosphonates. But this is just something that can happen. And it first was diagnosed in, in like 2005 was the first article about it. And now it's, uh, everyone is, is pretty much aware of it. And the, and the x-ray on the left is a, is a um, law firm that uh, is um, um, requesting patients call them uh, for a uh, lawsuit against Fosamax. So there's other things that could happen uh, with uh, bisphosphonates too. Is avascular necrosis of the jaw, which is very rare, but uh, probably terrible to get. Um, there are some patients uh, who, if they're at risk for that, can get atrial fibrillation, especially with um, Zometa, Eclasta, uh, and um, Fosamax. So women especially are at risk to get atrial fibrillation. It has to do with the calcium. Um, so the rule of thumb with bisphosphonates is, well, what do you do now with people on Fosamax or bisphosphonates or other, other ones? I think most people feel that after five years, you should give them a holiday, a drug holiday. And how long, nobody really knows. Uh, I would, I mean, I have no idea. I would, I tell people maybe three or six months. What do you say, Doug, to people? Sounds good to me. Yeah, nobody is really, no one really knows. So after five years, the added benefit of, of uh, bisphosphonates uh, is, um, is, is pretty inconsequential, so it doesn't really help you that much to continue in it. 
Um, the people who broke were uh, the median age were seven years. So it, you know, it's not like phosphomex after one year you're at risk. It takes a long time for the for you to get these fractures. So so um, you know after five years it's probably reasonable. And then the other things uh, you can just tell people if you ever get thigh pain, it may be a stress fracture. Tell me right away. I'll take you off the bisphosphonates, and you have to be careful. And the other thing is people can also get esophageal cancer from bisphosphonates. And the people at risk for that are people with known Barrett's disease of the esophagus or people who have some other type of risk factor for esophageal cancer or have esophageal cancer. So any questions up until this point? If those that fractured their femur, was there any um, measure of their level of physical activity? She, she, wasn't, she was not an athlete. She does normal activities of daily living, okay. low-demand individual. But she, we always recommend weight-bearing exercises for most people with osteoporosis. She doesn't do any exercise, but she does work outside of her house. Okay. Okay, so one more thing I want to go over is um, bisphosphonates and AVN. So uh, this is an MRI of AVN of the femur. And there is evidence that bisphosphonates helps with AVN. So just in general, AVN is avascular necrosis, especially of the femoral head. And um, there are many things that can cause it. <coughs> I guess steroids is the most common. After two or three years of AVN, the femoral head goes on to collapse, and then you need a total hip. It's very painful. So what can you do about it? Really not much other than a, uh, a coring of the femoral head. You just drill a hole into the femoral head and hope that the ingrowth of bone and vasculature helps with the AVN process to deter it. But the latest thing now is to use bisphosphonates for AVN. And um, there was an article in JBGS in 2005 where uh, after two years, um, only four out of 29 people collapsed in the alendronate group compared to 20 out of 25 collapsed in the control group. So that's pretty good. Do you, so, um, do you use a, a alendronate for AVN? I am now. <laughs> it's but pretty easy. I, I was unaware of that. Yeah, and, um, it, help, it helps. It, it's, a, it's a new thing. It start, I think it started in Japan, and uh, now it's catching on in uh, the United States. My, actually, I didn't know about this at all. My brother told me about it. and uh, him here next time. He, it's too far for him. <laughs> so, um, so that's a new treatment. Unfortunately, you can't do a procedure uh, with Fosamax. So you lose the core decompression, but you gain the patient because the patient will uh, be very appreciative why can't you do it? A core in addition? Yeah. Uh, that's never been studied, but that's a good question. You could try that. Because this guy wants a core, and um, he's got bilateral disease. I, yeah, I would. I guess you can do a core, and then you can wait three months, and then start uh, bisphosphonates if you want to give them both. Best of both worlds. Let them heal the core. That's an option. I don't think that's never been studied, and it's never going head to head. So it's, a, it's an interesting ask, or wait six months maybe, so you're sure that the bone has grown in. And then. What does the, uh, what does uh, this phosphate have to do with core decompression? Though? Nothing. Does it, does it uh, inhibit the healing? It, it, yeah, it's not good. So, so just, uh, I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, moving from fractures to cores, but right. in fractures, you want to, you want to uh, make sure the fracture is completely healed before you start the bisphosphonate because the bisphosphonate goes to active bone turnover areas. So it's not as important as in Fosamax because Fosamax you take it every week. But like if you do reclast, if you give the reclast uh, after a fracture, all of the medicine is going to go where the fracture is, which you don't want that. You want it everywhere. So uh, the bisphosphonates have a predilection to go to high bone turnover areas. So you don't want to give it after a fracture. You want to wait till the fracture is totally healed so that it spreads all through all your body. So I would say, now, now the correlation now is the femoral core. You probably want to wait for the core to totally to heal before you start the bisphosphonate. So I'm just trying to figure out why, um, what the bisphosphonate has to do with collapse. Are they saying that um, it does something has with, to bone do with uh, bone resorption? I, I don't, I don't, I don't really know. What, I don't know if anybody really is sure of that. Yeah. But it has something to do with bone turnover. Right, because you know what, the way they present it, it's sort of like. ABN is, is pressure, 
or a demon in the bone. <coughs> the way to make that better is to get rid of the pressure or edema, you know, so you can compress it. But I wasn't really aware of. Um, well, that's a theory. Just like this, there can be multiple theories for right, just right. like light. You know, Einstein. That's how he got the Nobel Prize. Light can be a photon and it can be a wave. So you can look at things in two different ways. Yeah. So I always thought the uh, ABN, later ABN, was cell death, but I never really associated it with result of you know osteoclastic. Well, it makes sense. I mean, it's a, it's bone, so it has to do with resorption mm -hmm. and, okay. and bone turnover. Okay. So any questions? That's Ray Rice. Hopefully, he'll have another two hundred yard gain in two weeks. Any questions, anybody? All right, guys, thanks for coming.